Hey folks, welcome along. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, there's a few here, I'm Ben Keeps, and um, I'm going to sit down and shut up soon. But I wanted to wrap a little bit of context about um, why this is actually happening. So I, um, I'm really passionate about the cloud, the cloud with a capital C. Um, I think uh, all things being equal, it's a better way of, of doing stuff, whether that's infrastructure, software, or, or, or platform. Um, with that in mind, then the, the big challenge is making sure that all the barriers to, to actually adopt, adopting the cloud are overcome. Uh, that's why I um, came up with the CloudU program, which is a CloudU certificate. It's a basic cloud computing certification that Rackspace uh, supports, sponsors, um, which you're all welcome to go and do. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, and it's why I, uh, I got these folks behind me and to the side of me together to, to do a panel today. Um, all of these folks uh, have in some way are involved in helping to uh, relieve the barriers to, to cloud adoption. And two of the folks here are CEOs of companies that, that I'm in invested in. Um, so that with that disclosure aside, the reason that I'm investing in them is because I think that there's a, there's a core barrier there that they're overcoming. Um, so with that said, I really, uh, I'm happy to introduce my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Alex Williams from TechCrunch, to moderate the panel. Great, thanks, Ben. So we were just talking about really what are some of the hurdles uh, with the cloud right now. And uh, you know we're here right in the middle of a, a VM world. And for me, there's lots of complexity just in trying to uh, you know understand what they're talking about um, when you get into the vCloud stuff and all. Do you think that plays a part in the confusion because every vendor you know, is talking about something different about how they're approaching the cloud. Is that one of the major hurdles that you guys see? Yeah, even for something as simple as what's the core? I mean, like just comparing a one core machine on Amazon to a one core machine on Rackspace is confusing. And then you stack everything up from there and then multiply it by 10,000, whatever, however many nodes you're running, it gets incredibly complicated very quickly. How so? Uh, George. Well, uh, the, the first thing is, is that, um, you know, people, you, you have business units and stuff going and doing little things that are easy. So, you know, from the, I signed up for, for, for Salesforce.com to I got an Amazon account and have provisioned a few VMs. And, and that part's easy and you know, all fun. But when you need to actually uh, drive enterprise adoption, take the next step that, that you know, we're in the middle of trying to take. Uh, there are so many, uh, the problem comes, becomes just much more complex because it's no longer a problem of going to the Amazon console and uh, provisioning a, a few VMs. It's, uh, I need a private cloud, which means I need virtualization layer, uh, pr uh, and then a cloud platform on top of it. I probably want to take into account configuration management tools and then bring in cloud management. And uh, I need to worry about what all these many, many people are doing across the, the enterprise as a whole in the many different clouds that I'm dealing with. And so the, the amount of stuff that you need to wrap your hat, ha, head around is, you know, can, can be daunting. Great, great. And before I go any further, I just jump, jump right into the question. So why don't we uh, take the time to introduce, introduce ourselves. Uh, Matt Ellis, CEO of Cloudability. Uh, George Reese, I'm CTO of Instratus. Dave McCrory, I'm uh, here as an independent. <laughs> <laughs> you got my vote. <laughs> and I'm Mark Cox. I'm CEO of AppSecute. Great, great. So um, you're talking about this complexity, really. I mean, that's really what it's about. What, what do we need to start doing to, like, break this complexity down? I mean, we're talking about, you know, the need for abstraction. And, and I was talking about the analogy to, like, you know, the iPhone. And, and with the iPhone, you could just get your own app. You didn't have to go through a telco to get an app. You know, you, you could just get it yourself. And Amazon started abstracting the resources. And now we're at this point where now we need to have some ways to, to better abstract that, you know, that flow, in essence, between the data center and the third-party services. Yeah, I kind of think of it a little bit differently. I think that Amazon abstracted the kind of primitive resources. And the problem is that um, all of, well, not all, many of the clouds diff abstract the resources differently. So you're calling it, is this like Cro-Magnon Cloud or something like that? 
Well, if you look at the if you look at the primitive services, say a file system or a block store or the compute instance that you were talking about, where what is what is a virtual CPU instance? What do you really get with that? And it can vary from one cloud to another. So that abstraction difference makes it more difficult for people to grok things. So instead of the abstraction helping, it makes it more difficult. Uh, so I think that's where. Um, Maybe you need the additional tools um, to help you with that, to help you with dealing with the fact that the abstractions are different from one cloud versus another. Uh, not only abstractions of the hardware resources, but also how you do things. So you might do things one way with this cloud with the services and, uh, and capabilities it offers, and you may do things differently over here. They may, there may not be an equivalent. Um, that's, that's where, uh, that's where it becomes really difficult. That's, uh, uh, and that's just the beginning. Then once you want to deploy an application on top of that, um, you know, the whole idea of moving your application from cloud to cloud gets exceedingly difficult um, the more you depend on those same primitives that we were just talking about because of that, that abstraction problem. What, yeah. What's the AppSQ perspective on this? I'm curious. So I guess when we're talking about abstractions and barriers to the cloud. One thing is, as you say, Dave, people, people have different terms. I actually believe that fundamentally things are pretty simple. There's storage, there's databases. The same concepts apply all through the cloud. It's just that people at um, clouds are trying to differentiate themselves and give different names and a different spin on everything. So one of the things we're trying to do is look for the abstractions that are really actually in the, in the problem domain that are going to show up everywhere. And the, the, the whole education process, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of FUD out there. I mean, uh, we've seen some of it today even. Uh, where What's the FUD you saw today? <laughs> yeah, just some, just some uh, no FUD today. Uh, blog posts. But um, we, we are looking for those abstractions so that we can then present a single view and let people make it easier to transition between clouds and let people um, mix and match what they want, but that relies on actually identifying the abstractions. So, for example, we, we're using Cloud Foundry and that's got a, a standard set of APIs and a standard set of abstractions that cover some of it. And then we're looking at, okay, how do we bring Azure support into that, for example, and what are the equivalent um, abstractions between Azure and Cloud Foundry? And they are there. So I think that it's going to make things a lot simpler for people to evaluate if we can um, provide a simple set of abstractions that everyone can understand. So, you know, coming down to abstractions and kind of discussing this, you know, in terms of helping people understand these concepts, what are some of the metaphors you see emerging that help communicate these concepts to people and in the process helping develop better methods and processes that can simplify it and provide more continuity and you know, in this progress toward you know, that integrated software-defined data center, if you will, that is more defined by you know, the software than the people themselves. Anyone have any thoughts? George? Uh, well, you know, I, I'd say, you know, first off, it's, it, it's about moving the focus from infrastructure to applications so that people are thinking in terms of applications because, you know, first of all, once you do that, the particulars about the facts uh, of understanding how to equate a VM in Rackspace versus a VM in, in Amazon or some other cloud become less important. It becomes about, you know, in my view, it comes about management tools or your platform as a service tool worrying about those distinctions for you and making sure that the application is appropriately performant in each environment that it's deployed. Uh, you know, the, that, when, but when you say, you know, the focus moves to the application, a lot of people jump to, well, that means the end all be all of cloud computing's platform as a service. And I think that's a terrible mistake to Why? make. Well, because there are a whole, the, the, you know, ultimately the ideal cloud solution or the ideal technology solution so, software as a service where somebody else is 
packaged everything up and fully commoditized it and everybody can reuse it at a very efficient level. But we all know that you can't have software as a service for every single problem domain out there. The same thing applies to platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. They're just um, problems that aren't sufficiently mature enough to be commoditized at the software as a service layer that aren't appropriate for the platform as a service domain and you know even and, and and there are you know today even problems that aren't appropriate for even virtualization uh, so the reality is is that you know if you're going to be have a mature cloud strategy you're going to have and you're a big enough company you're gonna have aspects of all of the above uh, but um, I guess my, my point about focusing on applications is that regardless of whether it's deployed on bare metal or whether it's software as a service or somewhere in between, what you need to worry about is what's the problem you're trying to solve and is the software that is written going to solve that problem? And is the deployment model the most efficient mechanism for solving that? So, so the question that that begs is uh, if you if you follow that then what's the line between each of the two in other words what's the line between infrastructure as a service versus platform as a service and what's the line between platform as a service and software as a service and the reason I ask that is uh, so let's say that 80% uh, could could move to software as a service but every company has that unique extra thing that they want or that change or, or whatever it is, um, at what point does the software as a service become more of a platform as a service? Well, I, I'd say first thing is the way I've, I've got a nice little pretty graph I've done that, uh, you know, about, about that. And, and I really refer to it as a continuum. I don't think there's a nice dividing line where you say this is software as a service and this platform, this platform, this is, uh, this infrastructure. Because there's other things that are flowing into that as well. Well, like um, data as a service so, so, offerings. So, so is Amazon RDS, is that a, is that, uh, platform as a service is an infrastructure as a service. It's it's actually I think a uh, platform that is a more basic infrastructural piece of an application. You know, and and then you know the same thing is you know it's force.com really software as a service, the platform as a service. It's it, it's it's meaningless without the larger you know Salesforce.com you know ecosystem, but it's still a platform and you know. George, I think, yeah, the lines are blurred a lot, but we've, we've been customers and using platform as a service as well now for kind of six months, so we've got a, a perspective on it from a customer's point of view. And platform as a service is not just about applications. The other side of it is, is services. So again, you look at Cloud Foundry, there's, there's two things. There's apps and there's services, and there's a binding between those. And those services are how some of the, the other layers can come in, so we can... I think in the future we're going to start to see more and more wrapping up of infrastructure as a service and as services within platform and similarly software as a service and allowing the apps that are running on the platform to to use those different layers of infrastructure seamlessly. You see, I think you think it's confusing now. I think it's going to be a ton more confusing in three years' time. I mean, I, this this time reminds me totally of uh, a few years back, fifteen years back. I inherited a program at a big company. And we had 26,000 users of Windows NT, and Office ran on an average of 17 workstations, one version of it. We had so many different versions of Office. And it was out there because everyone needed this thing right now, or fix this problem, or this bug patch. And so I think one of the things you're seeing, one of the downsides of the cloud, is that everyone can have the problem, the, the, the solution to their problem. You want MailChimp, you want Emma, and you want some other mail service, you want Amazon SES, you all get it. Yeah. And, and so there's going to be this explosion of things where that little bit of extra juice that someone wants on their SaaS service is going to be there, and they're going to have enough customers to get some business and keep going. And abstracting it is going to be the last thing on mine. It's just even going to get our hands around it. But, but everyone knows how to use email now. No, as in an email as a service. Okay. Yeah. But there's a common understanding of how to use all, you know, yeah, there's different versions and everything else. But, but there's... But there's still that UI that everyone understands. Not as an email, as an end user. Email as in, I'm sending bulk email. So like, I'm sending a million emails a month. It's so programmatic. Like, but like, it, if I'm email. writing 
an app and I need to send bulk emails, what I want to see is I want to see a marketplace that says here's five different providers of bulk emails. I want to buy that one and attach it to my yeah, app. But what, what, everyone has a different focus. Some people want price, some people want performance, some people want features, some people want deliverability. Yeah, well, that's why we and they're just for email. Now, now uh, scale that up to all the other things we do in IT. And I think the marketplace is going to get really confusing and, and it's going to get really hard to agree on any kind of comments. But that, that's sort of what I mean by focusing on the application. Yeah. If you take the, the, I mean, and that's where, you know, email's more of a infrastructural platform thing. Uh, but if you focus on the actual application needs and you have tools that, you know, say, okay, for this I need price, for this I need performance, for this I need uh, you know, high availability, and have tools that are the arbitrator. I hate using the word brokerage, but you know, broker maybe brokering uh, the relationship between applications and, and platform. You um, hide all of that complexity essentially from the end users. And from the people making the buying decisions, I think it's going to be really hard to constrain people onto a single platform. It used to be. Does it run on Windows or does it run on Unix, that kind of decision? And now it's going to be a lot easier for some little group of consultants hired by the CMO to go into whatever the devil they like, even if you as the CTO are trying to say, stop, stop, stop. Well, that's exactly ahead, right. And that's where you get into like shadow IT. Yeah. And because everybody can go, and again, as we, I'm talking about PaaS a lot, but um, yeah. as, we, as we move to PaaS, it takes away a lot of the operational requirements and it makes it possible for a business unit to go and do their own thing. And um, yeah, I think we're going to see more and more of that but we, and going in different directions. We use all of the products I just described in our company, and there's still confusion about whether it should go out through MailChimp or does it go out through Pardot or through SES. And it's kind of like, even as a little company, there's like, which tool do we use? But, They're all kind of that, overlapping. But is complex. that really a problem ultimately? Mm -hmm. In other words, even if you had 100,000 different choices of different things that could make up your app. Each app is is unique in what its needs are. If it wasn't, then it would be a copy of the previous app that you already had. It's only a problem if you're trying to create some abstraction language that everyone agrees on and talks mm -hmm. about things like what's PADS and what's SAS. Yeah, but this is the idea of the federated yeah. cloud. This is this is um, a diverse ecosystem, and it, it's about choosing the best right. tool for a particular app. And as soon as IT try and constrain that down into one common infrastructure or anything like that. Um, it's people are gonna work around it. Yep. So, Dave, how is how is the data gravity issue play into this? Uh, so, uh, for those not familiar with data gravity, uh, the idea is that uh, the more data you have, the more you are attracted uh, to the data because you want to have higher bandwidth, lower latency uh, to your data. And as you interact with that data, uh, you usually write uh, to the data. And as you write more data, it grows. So you end up with a growth factor. And the, the ultimate example would be that you have more and more services attracted to the data. That therefore creates a virtuous cycle where you're writing more data, which grows it even larger. And you attract even more apps and services. Well, as something like that occurs in any cloud, private, public, what have you, um, it becomes more difficult for you to spread out and move your application from place to place unless you're doing something like replicating the data or doing something, uh, some, other, uh, some other thing to mitigate that, maybe caching or something like that. But it still becomes uh, very, very hard for you to just be free to move your application about uh, if you need any type of performance uh, at all in your application. But I, I, I'm curious about the data aspect of it, too, because I'm wondering how we're going to start to cultivate data if it is growing in such large amounts to start helping solve these problems. Uh, so I guess I, I see it as you're seeing effects already of, of data gravity occurring in things like S3, where uh, they surpassed uh, whatever it is. Uh, is it a... I think it's a trillion objects or something like that in S3. It's some insanely large amount now. Um, and the reason for that is you have all of these apps that can freely access that. Uh, so if you then wanted to move one of those apps uh, out, of, uh, out of there, um, it's going to get more, it's going to have slower access, which would be disadvantageous to you unless you move the data with it. 
So cultivating that data means you're, you're going to have to choose to replicate the data, which will be an added expense. So uh, that's really one of the artificial constraints you can create, right, is uh, I can make it free for you to transfer your data in, and then I'll charge you to transfer your data out. And then that becomes uh, a barrier for you wanting to leave. Is that, I'm curious what you guys' thoughts on, on this in terms of what other layers that we need. So so the, the data can, in the apps can, can flow better between the data centers and, you know, and the third party service providers. Well, you know, ultimately, if your objective is to be able to operate in multiple clouds, uh, let's say Rackspace and Amazon, just to keep it simple, then that means, and you're dealing with reasonably large levels of data, that means that you need to simultaneously, or at least eventually simultaneously, uh, have your data available in both environments, um, which means, you know, replication. Um, you know, you can't rely on the, you know, centralized or clustered, you know, geographically, um, proximate uh, database solutions that have been the mainstay of, of enterprise development because ultimately you're going to end up with, you know, the data gravity so it's going to be somewhere and it becomes, a, instead of becoming a high availability issue, it becomes a DR issue and if it's a DR issue that means your time to recovery into cloud B is governed by the time it takes to move that data over there. And we've seen that with EC2 East, with the outages yeah. and such. It, people go, oh, well, you know, why didn't they design their apps better and such? It's not that even people necessarily didn't design their apps better. It's I wanted lower, lower latency, higher bandwidth access to this service or set of services I rely on, and they all live there. So that's where I put my stuff. There's also a, a human element here. I mean, it's, taken, it's still taking engineers a long time to automatically build their app so that the only solution to growth is more nodes, not bigger nodes or faster disks. But when it comes to data, a lot of people are still in the stone age on this. I mean, there's too much, I'll just take a snapshot of this data and we'll work on this data. Or we did a recovery from that one over there and it's not programmatic and now I've got three or four copies of the data and I'm not sure which one's current. And I'll just not delete it because it's only a few cents a day and I'll come back to it later and this kind of cruft and around, um, when you talked about data gravity, I had this kind of vision of all the asteroids clumping together into a planet Earth, but there's a huge amount of little boulders flying out everywhere, and they add up. And, and there's a lot of confusion about this. I mean, there was a time when you could name your server after places or, or women's names or something like that. You have enough of them that you could kind of get your head around it. And people are learning to give their servers serial numbers because they come and go. And I think there's that lesson to learn about handling data so that you can be sure. One of the biggest troubles is not just the volume of data, but knowing that when you move it around, you're moving the right data in the right place. So you're not copying a stale copy over your fresh data and things like this. And there's a kind of, what's the word? People are very cautious around it because they're not comfortable with dealing with this yet. What's the people layer that's missing? The people layer. The, uh, there's a development and an operational aspect of, of that. I mean, first off, you've got business who's going off the, the shadow IT phenomena, so that's one people issue. Two, you've got IT that's built traditionally around control, which is at odds with the value proposition of cloud. And, uh, and then from a development perspective, how do you um, alter your learned behaviors about how you build applications so that they can deal with the issues we talked about here. What's the absecute view on that? Yeah, I think the split, the, there's a real difference in culture and divide between developers and IT operations. Um, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head, George, when you said that IT has been about control in the past. And that really it drives developers away. And developers with the cloud have more of a chance to go and do their own thing. So uh, our perspective is that we need to give visibility and in a shared environment between developers and IT. We need to give IT enough control that they can um, stop developers from uh, interfering 
um, where, where they're going to cause a problem with production systems or at least put some procedures and approvals in place. Um, and that, that kind of stuff is, is missing right now from many of the tools, especially the PaaS tools. That um, It's coming, but it's not there yet. And uh, also giving the developers some access to the production systems where they can monitor and, and contribute. And uh, at the moment, it's, it's too easy for developers to go off and do their own thing and for, or, or for IT just to look at the cloud and say, you know what, we're just not doing it because we don't have the control that we need. Are you seeing any progressive um, models for, you know, by companies that are that are starting to engage in practices that, you know, that that help um, cross this divide? Yeah, I mean, in, in our clients, the most progressive ones are setting up a kind of task force of the very best cloud people to go into the org and help them um, use the cloud faster, um, avoid the repeated mistakes that other groups are doing. And, and get control of it, and also re make recommendations about champion products. There are some you know, leading products out there. You can go and evaluate 10 of them and end up number 10 being the right one, or we can just show you the way and encourage you to do that. But most of all, it's about providing this kind of internal consulting group. But even there, they're struggling with things like cost, where um, before the service would have had brownouts for a year, whilst they figure out the right investment to scale it, and now they've just got bigger bills. And it, there, there's this kind of human pushback even on that where what are you guys doing from central office to tell us how to do this, we want to figure it out for ourselves. But they do seem to be the, the most forward thinking way of dealing with it. In some respects it seems like it's far more of a people issue right now than anything else. I mean where, where people are, you know, I'm, I'm hearing more examples of, of uh, groups forming that you know, across discipline where you'll have people who are like stationed in a customer service you know, organization, for instance, and you know they don't just have a social media person anymore. They have a group of people in the customer service operation who are trained in all aspects of, you know, how to communicate with, with customers, be it through Twitter or through a phone or whatever or whatever other means. It's, and I'm curious if that's something that you see. I mean, we talk about the lack of applications, the, you know, the complexity of data, the you know, all these other issues, but doesn't it just come down to people at some point? And are we, but are we starting to see some, a new kind of a workforce emerge that will be able to bridge this? I think the problem is that there are too few people that understand all the core concepts necessary, whether that be at the app developer layer or at the operational layer today. So um, there's becoming more awareness on the kind of DevOps side. Uh, that's kind of beginning to hit kind of that critical mass that, uh, uh, that we'd all like to see. But if you talk to the average, say, enterprise developer about concepts that are actually necessary to build proper applications for the cloud, they are nowhere near where they need to be to be able to, to do that properly. Um, and there's still plenty of operational people that just don't understand all of the new concepts that are being introduced, and we're just early on it. So I think there's a lot more of a shortage of that expertise right now. I, I think that'll be solved in time, but it's certainly a problem in my view right now. Is that creating opportunity for exploitation to really kind of cloud wash the issue, Oracle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, you see uh, traditional IT vendors right now um, are their approach to selling to the market is to uh, say, you know, hey, this problem, this product we have here, it's cloud, and um, you know, and often, you know, the, there's nothing cloudy uh, about it. Uh, you know, Oracle being the greatest Champion. example yeah. of, of that, but uh, even you know, VMware is, uh, in my opinion, a huge. Well, the, VMware is a. a a schizoid beast. I mean, obviously, the Cloud Foundry uh, team is really doing cloud stuff. But you, you know, you, you get the other side of the fence, the the virtualization guys, and uh, you know, selling. You know, vCloud is is not terribly cloudy, for example. But it just creates. I mean, what we're talking about just creates a fertile opportunity for the schizoid beast. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Of all types. But uh, you know the 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 challenge is is that uh, is that you know IT who's used to going to either single vendor or a set of approved vendors needs to have a look at uh, 
the, the bigger picture and understand what they want from cloud. Because once you understand the context of what, what's of value in the cloud uh, to you as a business, then you see the cloud washing more clearly than if your objective is, oh my God, I got to adopt cloud. I think the DevOps thing is an indicator that there is starting to be that kind of crossover. And yeah, there's probably not that many people who, who can do it really well, and they're probably the passionate early adopters of things. And there's also an assumption with DevOps um, that, well, to put it, how can I put this? There's an assumption that people actually care enough to go and learn everything they need to learn to, to use stuff on the cloud. And um, sometimes enterprise developers don't care enough, and they actually just want to hand off to IT and let IT take care of the care and feeding and maintenance of production applications and go home and not be on call. And um, uh, IT, uh, if, if IT can loosen up a little bit, like you were saying, George, and not necessarily try and control everything and pin it all down to one, to one small approved set of products, um, I think there is a way for it for it to reach, you know, for cloud to reach a broader audience where um, there is a collaboration there and IT are, it's a people issue. Again, IT need to be offering services to people rather than trying to control everything and, um, and worrying only about compliance. And I, I first them quickly, I, right? Yeah, I first started hearing the DevOps ter term, I would say three years ago maybe at OSCON and, and uh, I was, and I really was trying to grok it myself. And I finally came down to like seeing it as a community more than anything else. I mean, a community of people who had a like mind about something. Are we seeing other communities emerge that uh, are starting to help bridges divide? I mean, app developer communities or otherwise? I think, it, at least I think we are, but I think it's very early on. You're only getting the developers that are passionate about their their craft, so to speak, or are incredibly interested in doing cloud development or uh, or automation or something like that. Those are the people that are going out and seeking out the information instead of being kind of hit with it, and they're forming those early communities. But they're not these gigantic communities that I think we'd all like to no, see. No, well, they start small, right? I mean, they're very small right now, though, in my view. You are seeing some. Uh, there's a kind of some pseudo communities. We're seeing a lot of people go from Java and, and C, C Sharp, C++, onto things like Python and Ruby. Sure. And in doing that, they kind of are starting to get a bit more respect for these toy languages yeah. that can just get pushed out. And it reminds me a lot of in the 90s being patted on the head patronizingly by a Unix programmer. I was a Windows guy being said, no serious company would ever run their infrastructure on Windows. And eight years later, we had 20,000 users on this thing. And people kind of came across to it as the technology developed as the opportunities grew, you know, and they can bring something to this. Our Java programmers in our company bring a real kind of extra level to the Ruby coding that we do, and there's this kind of mixture, and that's kind of how you suddenly wake up and a bunch of Java guys are quite happy to work on the cloud, and you didn't see it coming. Mm. And, and it's exciting because the cloud lets you mix and match much more of those different technologies. Yeah. I would say the NoSQL communities are, are helping one, in, yeah. in a lot yeah. of ways yeah. as well especially with learning some of the newer concepts, cap theorem and such, that is fairly new, especially to enterprises. They understand RDBMS. That's what they do. Uh, so the idea of moving from, from MySQL and Oracle and SQL Server and all of that over to these things where uh, they, they have an entirely different take on what you should do with data is, uh, is a good thing. So are we circling back to the apps? So it's those communities who are developing the apps, that the apps then will then help transform this perspective? I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at it from a cloud perspective, some sort of grandiose strategy thing, it's, uh, it, 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 it's kind of hard to see. But if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, people are solving a problem of we need to have, uh, you know, distributed eventually consistent data uh, yeah. uh, and by the way that really goes a long way to solving the problem we just were talking about earlier about having redundant data across geographically dispersed uh, uh, environments. Well, well um, communities are never strategically formed. Are they? No, no, no. And I didn't mean to suggest that. I'm just saying that you, you see, you know, 
DevOps community building up, NoSQL community building up, and these are all solving elements of the problem. Uh, you know, cloud's a big, big problem, and uh, and, and and tackling it as you know, wrapping your mind around it's a is a challenging thing. But when you look at all these smaller problems, you know, that they, they do have the community. Well, we're starting to see. I mean, if you graphed it out, you you start to see these communities almost like you know they're tiny, tiny, tiny little you know dots, and now they're starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the, you know the dots are starting to grow all over this graph in many ways, and so it, and, and eventually what happens in those cases like there there starts to see some symbiosis, you know between the between the different groups and. Sure. How do you how do you apply DevOps to your NoSQL solution? And you start seeing, uh, seeing those things happen. I think we're just very early on. It's, or yeah yeah how, or, yeah exactly like. The, uh, the idea of developing applications with components, for instance, and instead of just coding it you know, directly from the ground up, stuff like that. So on the flip side, though, and, and I thought I'd end it on this, is this whole education, this, you know, this topic of education. It seems ironic to me that today VMware talked about their, you know, their education effort, where it's basically you know, a major consulting organization that they're going to be developing. And is that is that the is that approach that does that have value in this day and age? Is that kind of thing that is needed, or is that just kind of exacerbating the problem that we have? I I, I, I hope that if if that is long term what's needed for cloud, cloud isn't going to succeed. <laughs> However, having said that, right now, uh, cloud's an educational cell. I mean, you have to you have to teach people as they're adopting it. So. I was going to say, it's just whatever it does, it's going to make VMware a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it depends what message they're going to be spreading through their consulting organization. If you see all these little communities growing and the consultants are coming and saying, you know, you've got to stomp on this and you've got to you know, um, pick, right. pick something and enforce compliance, I don't think it, it's going to work. But if the consultants are saying, hey, this is a new way of doing things and we need to embrace these new technologies, the, the NoSQL, the different languages, um, and find a way to have, have have operations work with all those different technologies, then um, maybe that consulting can be a good thing. Maybe or perhaps it comes back to the peer learning, right, where, you know, often communities will galvanize around their own small events where they're, they finally get to see each other, they get to know each other, their ideas spread, they go on and on and on. Well, it sounds more like we're putting, we're dancing around hoping that the VMware consultants are, are good at their craft. <laughs> Sometimes even if they're not, just getting in a room with other people who also want to do this gives you the confidence to go to your boss and ask them for permission to proceed or do a project on this. Right. I think there are a lot of people out there who are really excited about this cloud thing, but just don't know where to start. And I, you know, when I came here from London to live, I, was, I thought I was kind of at the forefront of things in London. You guys are just all six to nine months ahead in the community. And um, I think it's easy to underestimate. It all seems obvious here, but a lot of people out there who, who, who haven't heard any of this stuff yet. Right. So any education examples that you're seeing that are effective? Outside of Cloud U, of course, but are you saying, Jor? Well, I... I, I... And is that part of your business? Do you have uh, well, so our business is selling software, and, and, and we, we don't really, we, we want a world in which it isn't an educational cell that you don't need a bunch of professional services and stuff. And the best way to get there, from our perspective, is for organizations to adopt, um, you know, pilot projects that have well-defined, you know, that that are based on an understanding of what they want out of cloud with, you know, measurable objectives and, you know, and at the same time, baby steps, not trying to boil the ocean, move all of IT at once to cloud or anything like that. Uh, those are the best way to do things because you get to evaluate the suitability of the solution to what you're trying to accomplish while at the same time learning the various moving components that, that need to, to occur. Um, but the last thing you as a consumer of cloud want to get into is a world in which it, it, you know, you've moved from one professional services model to another. What's the apps give you? We'll, we'll finish up from there. So 
we had an interesting experience where um, we ran for a little while. We were going to do our own cloud, and before we realized that wasn't a good idea, and we should just use our management tools. But we we had some users coming on board, some, some kind of friendly alpha users, and they hadn't experienced PaaS before, and it was an education process for them. But they they suddenly went, "Wow, this is this is amazing! I I just didn't know that this was possible." So I would say, pick a project. Um, a, a couple of apps or a, a small app and, and experience it and run a pilot and um, it becomes obvious that it's a good thing once you actually go and do it. Once again, it comes back to people and experiences, doesn't it? Anyway, that I think we can end it right there. Thank you guys very much for taking some time to be here. Thank you, every, everyone, for, for attending. Talk to you soon. Thank you.